and God bless you. It is a delight to be here before you again to preach the Word of God. It's a delight to be in the fellowship of God's people on the Lord's Day. I like the way that uh, David made the announcement a while ago. <clears throat> We're going to have to start a new tradition here. I, I never thought of that before. You provide the answers and I'll come up with the questions. <laughs> that was... That was pretty good. You know, of all the things that we do <clears throat> when we come together to worship God, all the serving at the table and the preaching and the leading singing and prayers and all, I would rather do any of that than make announcements. I, I don't know why, but I always have trouble getting through announcements. And, uh, it's easy to stumble over things when you're trying to get all your details straight. We're trying to announce to people what the facts are, and I guess there's a little pressure there or something. But uh, anyway, he got it straight. Uh, fifth Sunday this month is question and answer night. And you the questions and I'll be the answers. One of these days we may reverse that, but I don't know. We are in the series. <clears throat> Once again, I'm coming to the morning with a uh, series that was originally planned for the evening because I overlooked some schedule changes that we had. And in order to get all the lessons in that I wanted to preach in this series... Uh, I'm having to put a couple of them into the morning time frame. Uh, these lessons were all calculated. I don't know if you're hearing them that way and noticing it as we go through, but they're all calculated to be a step-by-step -step progression through the Bible and through the uh, preaching of the gospel. This morning's lesson, the record of it, is found in a book called... Uh, you can understand the Bible. The sermon is transcribed as it was preached, and uh, I have reduced that to uh, a usable outline so that I don't have to stand here and, and read a manuscript. Uh, it's on page 102 of that book, published by Brother Thomas Warren. Thomas Bratton Warren was born August the 1st, 1920, at Carrizo Springs, Texas. He graduated high school as valedictorian of his class, graduated from Abilene Christian University with a B.S. degree, magna cum laude. He earned the M.A. in religion from the University of Houston and the M.A. and Ph.D. degrees in philosophy from Vanderbilt University. He also studied at five other institutions of higher learning. Brother Warren served as teacher of Bible, theology, Christian apologetics, uh, philosophy, logic, and mathematics. He taught at Abilene Christian College, served both as president and chair of the Department of Bible at Fort Worth Christian College. He was chair of the Bible Department at Fried Hardeman College, professor of philosophy of religion and apologetics at Harding Graduate School of Religion, and also served as dean of the graduate school and professor of philosophy and Christian doctrine and apologetics at Tennessee Bible College. Thomas Warren was a prolific writer Having authored or edited more than 50 books, he was founding editor of The Spiritual Sword. His book, Have Atheists Proved There Is No God, is a definitive and logical answer to the atheist's argument from the problem of evil. The Warren Flew debate on the existence of God and the, and the Warren Matson debate on the existence of God, 1976 and 1978 respectively, were attended by thousands and the uh, printing of those debates uh, remains uh, available today. Brother Warren was a veteran of World War II, serving in the United States Air Force as an aerial navigator. He was married to Faye C. Brower on October the 3rd, 1941. They were married for nearly 59 years until his death on August the 8th, 2000. The Warrens were the parents of two daughters and one son. Thomas B. Warren has been acclaimed by friend and foe alike as the greatest apologist uh, for the existence of God in the 20th century. His biography appears in several volumes, among which are notable Americans, men of achievement, who's who in America, outstanding educators in America, and directory of American scholars. The charts accompanying this sermon were designed and drawn by Thomas Warren. <clears throat> we begin our study with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We find Adam and Eve in a perfect state as created by God. It could be nothing less. 
God put them there and gave them access to the tree of life by which they could eat and live forever. They had never been involved in nor known or of anything about any sin. They had perfect physical health. They were not facing physical death. They had fellowship daily with God. But they heard a lie. Eve believed the lie, and she persuaded Adam to join her in it. Later, the Apostle Paul would write in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 14 that uh, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so we begin at this point to see the steps into sin, the steps in the path of disobedience away from God. They believed a lie, and they obeyed the lie. They then became subject unto death. They died spiritually at the very moment in which they chose to reject the word of God, the will of God, and to obey the lie that they heard from Satan. And they were put away from the tree of life, which caused them then to begin to face the prospect of their physical death. The case of Adam and Eve illustrates the path away from God. Hearing a lie, believing a lie, obeying a lie or falsehood. The path back to God is simply the opposite. Hearing, believing, and obeying the truth. In Matthew chapter 25, <clears throat> and in verse number 46, Jesus comes to the end of his description of the judgment, that in which he describes the judgment as a shepherd separating his sheep from his goats. And he talks about the righteous, and then he talks about the wicked, and he concludes this way. And these, that is the wicked, shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Long, long ago, Joshua had spoken to the pe people of Israel, and he had said to them, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he listed the options that were for them. The, the gods in the land of, of their ancestors, uh, the gods of the lands that they had just uh, occupied, uh, which were many idols uh, that men had created. But he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The admonition that was in that challenge, that offering, stands today to all the people of the world. We have the choice. It is up to us which way we will go. God put us in the world and told us of the two uh, destinations that are possible and the ways to reach each one. But he does not force us into any particular path. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, and he said, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 16. In the seventh chapter of Matthew in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself had said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, that is restricted, narrow, tight, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We have options. There are two ways that we might go. There have always been two ways that we might go. In the days of Moses, as Israel was wandering in the wilderness on their way to their promised land, Moses had told the people, beginning in the 26th verse of Deuteronomy chapter 11, it's recorded, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day, to go after other gods which you have not known. The pathways before us are two. Jeremiah said, stand in the ways that is in the crossroads, in the pathways where the pathways split or divide. Stand in the ways and see and ask for the good path, or the old uh, paths, where is the good way, and walk you in it. But Israel, Judah answered him, we will not walk therein. We'll go our own way. 
And for that, of course, we know that they were taken from their homeland and uh, deposited elsewhere, scattered amongst the peoples of the Babylonian Empire. The role that falsehood plays in our choices, in our world, in our lives, are illustrated perhaps in this chart, in which Satan speaks a falsehood, and the lies are out there, have been there now in the world since that day that, Eve, uh, that Satan sp first spoke to Eve. The words are there, but when we allow them to enter into our minds, when we listen, that is not just hear, but heed, pay attention to that lie, we are on a path that leads to disobedience to God's will. Hearing and listening to a lie and understanding a lie is not necessarily a sin. In fact, the New Testament admonishes us to know what the world around us is teaching, to walk circumspectly, to be aware of everything around us. Paul instructed Timothy a couple of different times to be aware of what was being taught by other people in other places and to preach the truth. And so listening is not necessarily a sin, but it can lead to the sin when we believe the lie instead of the truth. And so we see people entering into the pathway of temptation. The pathway of disobedience that begins with our temptation. Man sinned. He turned his back on the tree of life because he yielded to the temptation that was presented to him. The greatness of what he lost, the loss of that tree of life, was terrible beyond explanation or description. But how did it happen? How can it happen in our own lives? we can see a clear description in the Word of God from beginning to end of what is illustrated here in the case of Adam and Eve. We go to the New Testament uh, epistle of James. In chapter 1 in the epistle of James, we can read beginning in the uh, 13th verse. Read your, uh, verses 13 through 15 in James chapter 1, in which he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. It's a very simple step-by-step -step path that ought not to be difficult for any to understand. It can happen to any of us. As long as we live in the flesh, the lusts of the flesh can tempt us away from the pathway of God. But we don't have to yield to the temptation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13, God's word says there is a way out. There's always a way out. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God will with the temptation, he said, make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. We can stand strong in the face of the greatest temptation. Because if we are faithful Christians, and the letter was written to those who were following Jesus Christ, the promise is to them, and all who like them walk in the pathway of truth, God will not suffer you, permit you, allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. That is a promise beyond imagination in this world that God should give us such protection as that. There are many things in this world that would call our attention away from God. There are many things that would tempt us to do what is not right, to lead us away from the tree of life. But there is always a way out provided by God. 
hearing a falsehood brings the temptation. And so the matter boils down to a controversy or a contest between truth and falsehood. The journey to separation from God begins with the hearing of a lie. That just means that man hears false doctrine. There are all kinds of false doctrines about us. The Bible teaches the truth. It's up to us, to each one of us, to study the Bible for ourselves. Don't take any man's word for what God wants, what God wills, or even what's written in the book. You have the responsibility and the ability to go to the Bible itself and study it and learn what it teaches. God did not give the Bible to church authorities. He didn't give the Bible to colleges and universities. He didn't give the Bible only to preachers. He gave the Bible to the whole world, to each and every individual in it. And so we find, as we look through God's Word, steps in the path away from God. The first step is always hearing the lie. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God says, They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That perhaps is where it starts. Having a foundation of pleasure in unrighteousness that allows us to listen to the false doctrine when it comes along. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this because it's what people expect out of me, but boy, I sure would really like to enjoy some of that other stuff that's out there. And as long as we have that kind of thinking and thought in our minds and are not committed to, converted to, dedicated to, the will of God in our lives, we are always susceptible to hearing and following after a false doctrine. We listen to it. We mull it over. We think about it. But we don't have to dwell on it. Let it go in your ear and out the other side if necessary. You know, just don't pay attention to the false doctrine when it comes along because that's the first step in the separation from life in Jesus Christ. The second step is that we believe the lie that we have heard. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6, Eve saw that the tree was good for food and desired to, to, be, uh, to make one wise. And so she believed what Satan had told her. And she gave the fruit to her husband and he ate with her. They didn't have to do that. They didn't have to believe what Satan was said. They had already heard the word of God. They had lived for a time with God in perfect peace and contentment. They had everything that they could ever possibly have needed, and yet Satan tempted with something that they did not need, didn't really want, because they were people of God. But they listened, and then they believed. They could have chosen to believe God's truth, to stand in the belief that had always been theirs, but they chose to believe the lie. And the third step was, believing it, of course, they simply obeyed it. She gave it to her husband, and he did eat. Nobody forced him to eat that. There was nobody standing there. As far as the record is concerned, it seems that Satan came in and spoke and she left, I mean, and Satan left, and she was left there alone. And she went and talked to her husband, and there's nobody else in the picture. Nobody forced them to eat from that tree. They chose to do that. They didn't have to obey the lie, but they did choose to do so. And the result of that was, of course, their death. They were banned from the tree of life. God, the scripture says God drove man out. You know, when I was on the farm, we used to drive cattle. And you don't just say, cow, would you mind going over there? You know, sometimes you have to get behind them with a stick or a whip and make them go in the direction you want to. 
And with pigs, the problem's even worse. I don't know how stubborn Adam might have been. He was being cast out of his home. But God didn't just say, Adam, see you later. He drove him out. He cast him out. He threw him out of the Garden of Eden. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 4 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now the point in that passage is, I'm not going to die for your sins. But the passage also does teach that I am going to die for mine. And that's what happened in Adam's case. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. The wages are what you expect after you perform the service or produce the product. And so when Adam performed the service of disobedience to God, he got what he had earned, he got what he deserved, he got separation from God spiritually, separation from the world physically, as he died according to the promise of God. We must remember always the... Uh, we must remember always the justice of God, the infinite justice of God. God is holy. He always has been, and he always will be. He is righteous. He cannot tolerate sin and still be God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the 13th verse says, he cannot deny himself. He can't be not God. And so he cannot tolerate sin. It's not God's arbitrary choice to punish sin. He simply cannot do otherwise and still be God. We noticed in our Bible class this morning, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The grace of God hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world, God's grace has appeared to everybody, but not everybody is saved. The grace of God appears teaching us. Well, you know, if somebody tries to teach you something, you can listen or not. And if you listen and understand the message, you can pay attention to it or not. If he teaches you that this is the way to go, then you can go that way or you can choose not to go that way. Not go anywhere or go a different way or go to a different destination. Teaching doesn't save. It's our listening to and following after the teaching that uh, is the agent of our salvation. The grace of God, as we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, without faith it is impossible to please Him. It is impossible to to please him without faith. When we believe what God says and act upon what God says, then his grace saves us. This is the justice of God. All the faithful are saved. We would not expect it to be otherwise. We wouldn't think much of God if it were otherwise. All of the faithful are saved. But then we must accept the other side of that, that all those who reject God are choosing to be lost. I don't want God's will. I don't want God's way. I don't want God's law. So you don't have God's home. People who say, I don't want society's laws are removed from society. They're locked away in a place where they don't have to worry about man's laws in the streets. And just so it is with God. When we reject him, we don't, when we reject his word, we don't have his blessings. The wages of sin is death. We read in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23. Mankind took the path of disobedience. He heard, he believed, and he obeyed a lie. He sinned. He turned his back on the tree of life. The result is spiritual and is physical death. The death he received was just recompense 
for his sin. God doesn't hate sinners. God doesn't hate those who are punished. God hates the sin, and he punishes the sin. The justice of God demands death for sin just as it demands life for faith. Adam and Eve heard and believed and obeyed a, law, a lie, rejecting the tree of life, and the result was their death. Again, in Paul's epistle to the Ephesian church, in the fourth chapter, verse number 18 says that, these, that, that such people are having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. When the heart does not see the rightness in loving God and, and His way, then they're ignorant of the truth, alienated from the life of God. Their understanding is darkened. They're separated. And they're lost. That's the path. That's the result of all who hear that lie, lie and believe that lie. The apostle wrote to the church in Colossae, Chapter 1 and verse 21 of that epistle. You that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath reconciled. That's what we're looking for. What can man do to go back to that tree of life? To have that relationship with God restored. There is a path to the tree of life, just as there is a path from the tree of life. The grace of God provides that path of obedience. By grace are you saved through faith. And not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. In Hebrews chapter 5, we read in verse number 8, beginning, that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. If we're looking for salvation from the punishment for sin, the pathway leads through obedience to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The penalty for disobedience, the end result of the path away from the tree of life is to be cast into outer darkness. But it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to hear, listen to, believe, and obey a lie. We can hear the truth. We can believe the truth. We can obey the truth. And we can avoid this terrible wage for sin. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't force our choices. His will is that we come to him his way. But he doesn't force us to do so. God is not willing that any should perish. But Jesus has described for us the judgment day in which the great majority will be said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And these shall depart into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. The power of truth is amazing in this world, and most people just don't give it a chance. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, if you follow after me, if you believe in me, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When the angel told Cornelius to send for Peter, he said, send for Peter who shall tell thee, words whereby thou shalt be saved. It really is as simple as that. Just reading the words of truth and believing the words of truth 
and obeying the words of truth will lead us to the end that we desire. In Galatians chapter 1, you remember that the Apostle Paul is justifying before the eyes of those who may have doubted him his apostleship. And he says, beginning in verse number 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God, into the, uh, unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Any other teaching will take you into that outer darkness. The teaching of God is that we are to hear his word, believe that Jesus Christ is his son, repent, turn from our sins, and confess our faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Be baptized into him for the forgiveness of those sins. And from that baptism we rise then to walk in newness of life. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. If we are going to be saved by truth, we need to know the word of God. We can escape from death and get on that pathway that leads back to God again, step by step. The first step, obviously, is to hear the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only acknowledge the sound of the teaching, but set your mind to contemplate it. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul uh, made it very clear that there is a step-by-step -step process. There are elements involved in leading souls to salvation. Beginning in verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We can escape from that terrible death, that outer darkness. First step, hearing the word of God. The second step, of course, is to trust God. To believe what he has said. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 uh, teach us that first passage I ever learned to memorize after I became a Christian, and I'm drawing a blank as I stand here this morning. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, the wisest man who ever lived wrote these words for our hearing. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It really is that simple. The third step in our escape from death is to then obey that true teaching. Hearing and believing are vain without obedience. James said that uh, uh, faith without works is dead. Chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. Obeying God's teaching means because this is uh, because this is what the word of God teaches. Obeying God's teaching means to hear the word, to believe that Jesus is the son of God, to repent from sin, to confess our faith and to be baptized into him and then to go on walking throughout our lives in the light of the word of God. Having taken the steps on the pathway back to God, we then find ourselves reaching that tree of life. By the grace of God, the word details the path. And hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, and walking in the light of the word of God in the church to which he adds us when we obey him. 
The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But we don't need to walk in fear of that. The Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi wrote in the fourth chapter and beginning in the sixth verse these words. Paul said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God will not suffer you to be lost as long as you walk in the light as he is in the light. And so the end of the path that we're taking back to God leads, in fact, to God, to eternal life. Think about it. Nothing in these steps merits or earns a home in heaven. Nothing is great, even uh, uh, coming even as, uh, coming even close to something as great as heaven. But the grace that saves demands our meeting the conditions of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized in the truth of Almighty God. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus is an interesting example to us. Saul was not saved by meeting Jesus on the road. He wasn't saved by hearing the words of Jesus. He wasn't saved by simply believing the words of Jesus, nor obeying the first part of going into the city. But after three days, Ananias said to him, And now why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. His sins were still with him. He was still lost and condemned to hell. The wages of sin is death. And that's where Paul stood until he obeyed what Ananias said to him. Calling on the name of the Lord is not saying something. Your obedience to the promise of God's grace is calling on the name of the Lord. Saul wasn't saved until he completed that obedience. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. And that applies to us as well as to him. You're on one of these paths or the other. You're on the path to God or the path away from God. Are you believing and obeying a lie? Are you believing and obeying the lie that maybe the Bible doesn't apply today or doesn't apply to me? Or are you believing and obeying the truth of becoming a Christian and living faithfully as a Christian. One path leads to outer darkness. The other path leads back to the tree of life. It's falsehood versus truth. In Romans chapter 6, again, that 16th verse, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Whose servant are you this morning? I didn't ask whose servant do you want to be or whose servant do you think you are or whose servant you maybe someday will be, but whose servant are you today? The answer is whoever you believe, whoever you obey. Will you believe the word of God and walk in his righteousness? We can help you. God will forgive you if you'll repent from your sin. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. God will forgive you if you've never become a Christian. The pathway has been laid out clearly by God. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent from sin. Come confess your faith in Him and we'll baptize you into Jesus Christ today. If you'll come right now, while we stand and sing. Uh,